John chapter 5 is our text today. We are going to be starting our reading in verse 30, and we will read to 47. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard. His form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures, because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me, that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? This is God's holy word. May he add his blessing to it. You may be seated. And let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we again come to you in prayer, asking for you to bless uh, this time spent studying your word. Lord, help me to preach your word faithfully. Help me to preach it with the power that it's that this is worthy of, Lord. And we know that we can never fully understand the depths of it and all this. But we pray, Lord, that you would feed us well with your word now, that you would help us all to behold glorious and wonderful things about our Lord Jesus here this morning. Pray that you be with each person who's hearing this message. Lord, help us to be good hearers, hearers that don't just hear and forget, but those who hear and do and act and that truly believe. Lord, would you quicken our hearts. May you cause us to have ears to hear, eyes to see, and hearts that understand and treasure your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, there are many in our world today who, when it comes to meaning and purpose in life, are bouncing around and floating from this thing to that without any care. They are easily steered by media, social media, social pressure, their own passions and desires. We're all like that. We've all been like that. You might remember the time when that was definitely like you. No meaning, no purpose, just kind of bouncing from thing to thing. Or maybe you are still like that today, this very moment. The problem with this whole idea of having no meaning and purpose, it's this idea of being rootless. No roots. You just kind of blow around like chaff, like tumbleweed on the prairies. Or to put another image on it, it's like being rudderless and the current just takes you where you will and and you've got nothing to grip it, nothing to steer. You just go wherever the currents go. Or it's like being a planet out of orbit with no center to pull you into alignment or to pull you onto course. You know, think of our galaxy. It's like a wonderful children's mobile spinning, isn't it? Above, spinning above the crib. And we're held together at the center of it as we orbit the sun. And it's in that connection to the center where each part finds its purpose and meaning. We all are connected to it. Now, nowhere is this truer, and I'm using this as an image, than when it comes to our souls, our very lives. We must be connected to something at the center. And really, it's to the one and only one who is at the center of it all, Only when we are connected with the one who's made us will we know why we were made. Will we we be 
have a rudder or have roots or have a, a connection to the center. Only then will we be saved. Now, this is what we're going to see today in our text, the center. And the center is a person. The center is Christ. Now, last two weeks, we've been marching through John chapter 5. We began with the healing at Bethesda, and that was at the start of chapter 5, and we've been marching through ever since. Um, things soon got tense, we noticed after that. The Jewish leaders, they challenged Jesus, and they challenged him on working on the Sabbath. They said, they said to him, why are you doing this? You know, you can't be from God, you're doing that. But Jesus answered them, this is verse 17 of chapter 5, my father is working until now, and I am working. And then we read the very next verse. This is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him. Because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And ever since, we've been reading this large response that Jesus has given to this. So last week we went from verses 19 to 29, and we saw in that, Jesus described his relationship to the Father, saying that he and the Father are united in purpose, that he, he has come as the eternal Son, but as the eternal Son, he has subordinated himself to the will of the Father, and that he does whatever the Father tells him to do. It says in verse uh, 19, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. And so we see the Trinity on display here with both this eternal Son who has come in the flesh now to do the Father's will, and yet everything the Father does, the Son does. The Son and the Father are one, and, and we could add to that the Spirit as well. Um, so Jesus has been explaining this deep theology. He goes into especially talking about his ability to give life. Okay, and we saw that last week, his work of life-giving. As the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. That's verse 26. And we didn't really cover that last week, but that's a profound statement. You do not have life in yourself. Your life and my life is contingent and dependent upon God to give it. Every breath you breathe, it's borrowed we are stewards of everything. We're stewards of the money we get. We're stewards of the time we get. We are stewards of every heartbeat, stewards of every breath. God gives it. He gives it. Well, the Son has life in himself. He is the uncreated creator. This is, Jesus has been doubling down, hasn't he? You know, they're worried, hey, you're, you're kind of blaspheming here, saying that you're equal with God. And, and Jesus says, oh, it's not blasphemy. It's not blasphemy. The Father is working. The Son is working. I have authority to give life. I am the judge. I am the creator. I am all these things. He's claiming deity. He's claiming again and again the prerogatives of deity. Well, let's move today. We're moving further into Jesus' response. He continues with verse 30. And, he's, and here it's a little bit of a, a change. We start now with a parade of witnesses. A parade of witnesses. So he's still talking to the hostile Jewish leaders. And we're going to see things get a little tense. So let's, this is a, I usually give points one, two, three. But today we're going to have A. A big, this is going to get, this is old school. We're going to have a big A for the first point. There's going to be a B. There's going to be a C. But under A, I'm going to have points one, two, and three and things like that. Okay, so this is a little unusual. But if you take notes, take note of that. So A, the parade of witnesses. Again, it is highlighted that Jesus does not speak independently or on his own authority or for himself. We read this in verse 30. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And he talks about, he's, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. So what does Jesus do? He's, he's basically saying, there are others who speak for me. I don't need to defend myself here. I don't need to do this. There's witnesses. Now, here's who, do, who does he call to the witness stand? Who is the parade of witnesses? Well, first, let God the Father declare and testify. Then let John the Baptist take the stand. Let the works that I do tell the story. Let the scriptures speak. They will witness. Let Moses speak. 
they will witness. He, this, the way the passage goes is he just brings a parade of witnesses to explain and to show this is who I am. Now, witnesses about what exactly? About the person of Jesus Christ. Witnesses to him. The scriptures, he says later on in the passage, bear witness about me. Moses, he says, wrote of me. They witness that he is the son of God, that he is the son of man, that he's the true prophet, that he's the Christ, the Messiah, that he's the creator, that he's the judge, that he's the savior, that he's the redeemer, that he's the giver of eternal life. All of these things have been witnessed to and are being witnessed to. That's the parade of witnesses that he sets in front of us today. Well, let's begin. So this will be point one under the parade of witnesses. The Father's testimony. Verses 32. Now Jesus does the will of the Father, he says before that. He speaks and does what he has seen and heard. So as uh, one commentator points out, his witness is therefore not simply his own witness. It is the witness of the Father. This is a, a kind of a, a technical point. But when Jesus declares who he is, That's not his own witness. That's the Father's witness because what we learned earlier, he only speaks what the Father tells him to speak. So when he witnesses, the things he says are what the Father wants to say. So he is saying that in this passage. His witness, therefore, and I keep reading the quote, is not simply his own witness. It's the witness of the Father. And this is where he says in verse 32, there is another who testifies in my favor. He declares, and in the light of these verses, this another is the Father. He does change direction right away and talk about John the Baptist, but this another, this other who witnesses to Jesus is the Father. Now later in the passage, we see the witness of the Father again. Verse 37, and the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. So God the Father is testifying to who Christ is through Christ's words and works because Christ is doing the works of the Father. So Christ's words and works, they reveal him to be divine, to be the son of God, but they also show us what the father is like because of the union between the father and son. If you see the son, you see the father. This is what Jesus says exactly to Philip in chapter 14, verse 9. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the father. How can you say, show us the Father? You've seen the Son. You've, therefore, you've seen the Father. So Jesus' words and his works are the witness of the Father. But the Father has also testified to Jesus' identity in other ways, through direct speech, like at Jesus' baptism. We read in Matthew 3, 17, And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. That's the witness of the Father as well. Or at the transfiguration, the voice comes, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And even later in John, chapter 12, we read this. Uh, John 12, 28 to 29, Jesus says, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and I will glorify it again. The crowd that stood there and heard it said that it had thundered. But God the the Father, we see there, his testimony has come in an external way, but it's also within all of Jesus' works. But the testimony of the Father is even broader than those two things. The Father witnesses to Jesus through Scripture, through John the Baptist, through all who testify of Jesus because the Father is sovereign over all. So all of these things are, in a sense, the Father's witness to Jesus' identity. He appointed John the Baptist. He inspired the scriptures. All of these things are pointing to Christ as witnesses of who he is. Well, let's go to the next one, John the Baptist's testimony. First, we had the Father's testimony. Now we're looking at John the Baptist's testimony. This is verse 33 to 35. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. And then if we go to verse 35, he was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. Now, if you remember from this gospel alone, we've already heard John the Baptist's testimony. We read about his, his this is his role. 
chapter 1, verse 7, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light. And we heard his testimony. He told the Jewish leaders in chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, I am not the Christ, but among you stands one you do not know, even he who comes after me, the strap of whose sandal I'm not worthy to untie. Later, he, he sees Jesus coming and he declares, Behold, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I said, after me comes a man who ranks before me because he was before me. And then we, we go on, another one in chapter 1, verse 32. And John bore witness, it says, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and it remained on him. Now that's speaking of a story not, not actually captured here in the detail, but the story of Jesus' baptism. We read in the other Gospels more details of it. And the final bold statement in chapter 1 of John, John the Baptist says this, And I have seen and I have borne witness that this is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. So that's chapter 1. John goes on. He has more than he says in chapter 3 as well. But that's his testimony. This has been his ministry, that of a pointer. He's the pointer, not the point. Okay? He's a forerunner. He is a spotlight shining on Jesus. He's not himself on, at center stage. He's the foreword at the start of the book. Okay? He's the herald announcing the king. Make way! You know, if you watched the coronation yesterday, you probably don't remember anyone who announced anything, but you probably remember King Charles, right? He's the point of that ceremony, not the guy who rolled out the carpet, not the guy who opened the door, not the guy who drove the carriage. We don't even think about them, hardly. Well, that's John the Baptist's role, and he glories in that role. He says, oh, I'm like the friend of the bridegroom. I rejoice. I'm so glad that my ministry is shrinking this is great because his is increasing. He must increase, but I must decrease. That is John the Baptist's wonderful testimony. And Jesus clarifies, though, here in, in this passage that he doesn't need that testimony for himself to give him confidence or to really establish who he is. He is who he is. He says, not that that testimony I receive is from man, but wh why am I telling you this then? I say these things so that you may be saved. So here's a little side point for you today. Does God need you to witness to others and to share the gospel? Is he absolutely dependent upon you? No. But he uses the witness of men and women and children to save. And even Jesus says, let me tell you about John's testimony again. His is a good testimony that's going to tell you the truth. He tells us these things so that we would be saved, it says. So God uses the testimonies of Christians to help others be saved. That's how God works it out in his, pro in his providence. But Jesus does not need it to establish himself. God would be true, though every man was a liar. If nobody believed in Jesus, Jesus would still be the glorious truth. He'd be the way, the truth, and the life. He would be who he is. Well, we read that some rejoiced in John's light, but only for a fleeting moment. The testimony of John was meant to lead them to a full receiving of Christ. This leads us to the next witness now. The testimony of the works of Jesus. Verse 36. John was supposed to set them up for this. Let's read verse 36 again. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing... Bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. Now this is, of course, would include the miracles that he just did. He said, you saw that. You saw, I just, I just healed that man. I just healed that other man. I turned water into wine. I did all these things. But it's going beyond the miracles. It doesn't just refer to the miracles. Notice the phrase, the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. What did God the Father send his son into the world to do? Was it to be a dancing bear? To do a bunch of miracles and, and signs, but for no real reason? No. God sent his son to save sinners. 
Now, the miracles are part of that. They're part of, of revealing who Christ is, of showing people this is the Son of God. And they are an act of mercy, God visiting his people with these merciful acts. But the purpose of Christ's coming is way bigger than this. It's our redemption. It's the salvation of the world. We read in Matthew 1.21, right at the very beginning of the gospel, the angel says to Joseph, your wife, Mary, soon to be wife, she will bear a son and you shall call his name Jesus. Why? For he will save his people from their sins. This is why this baby has come. This is why God has come in the flesh. Or Luke 19.10, for the son of man came, why? To seek and to save the lost. Or Mark 10.45, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, to save. He came to save us. The work of Jesus is the work of our redemption, to save a people from all over this globe. We read in Revelation 5, 9 to 10, you were slain, talking about Jesus, the Lamb of God, and by your blood... You, this is talking, this is what Jesus did. What did he do? Why are we praising him? You were slain, and by your blood, you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation, and you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Revelation 5, 9 to 10. So the work of Christ is no less than the salvation of the world. Not without exception, there are those who are lost, but without distinction from every tribe, tongue, and nation, this world will hear and be saved. There will be a people from every tribe, tongue, and nation worshiping the Lord. As a, a, a pastor, Doug Wilson, likes to say, the whole message of the Bible can be summed up in six words. Kill the dragon, get the girl. Do you like that? Kill the dragon, get the girl. I love that. Now you have to work with me here. What did, the, what did the son of God come to do? He came to defeat the ancient serpent, the devil, the dragon, as we, we hear him called. Kill the dragon. Crush the head of that snake. And to redeem who? His bride. The church is the bride of Christ. He came to kill the dragon and to get the girl, to win her forever, to redeem her, to pay her dowry, as it were, to, like Hosea and his, his awful bride who was unfaithful, to buy her back and to make her holy. This is what Jesus has come to do. In that sense, he's the true and better Boaz. You know the story of Boaz, the redeemer? You know, he redeems us Jesus is better than Boaz. He redeems us, this poor, wretched, lost, vulnerable, outcast. He's the redeemer. He makes us his bride. That is, and this is what, we, this is what we're talking about, the works that the Father has given me to accomplish. These are the works of God and not a mere man. And Jesus is saying, what I have come to do, and I'm in the middle of doing it right now, is bearing witness to who I am. No one can do what I'm doing, not just the miracles, but dying for my people. He has the power of an indestructible life. He has the power of a life that can pay for our sins because he's holy. He's perfect. He's the son of God and he's the son of man. He's the mediator between God and man. There's no one like him. There's no one who could accomplish this work except for Christ. And he's saying, this is what I've come to do accept it receive it believe in it do not disbelieve but believe now let's look now at the next testimony number four the testimony of scripture this is the parade of witnesses that they keep going and this really takes us to the end of the passage the testimony of scripture jesus says in verse 39 you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me now, Jesus is not discouraging Bible study here. It is good to search the scriptures. But it's not good to search the scriptures and miss Christ. It is not good to search the scriptures in a way that does not submit to the Lord and want to obey. There is a filling your head with knowledge that leads to death, that just puffs up. And he's saying, you are searching in that way. 
And you're missing the point. He goes on in verse 46 and 47. He says, For if you believed Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? He said, you guys are really big on Moses and the law. I can tell. You know, you're trying to kill me because I broke the Sabbath, even though I'm God. <laughs> okay? And he's saying, you're big on Moses and his law. But you haven't read Moses. You don't even know what Moses was talking about because if you did, if you truly knew the book of the law, you would be believing in me today. You'd be following me today. This is what he's saying. The testimony of Scripture witnesses to Jesus. Now, as we go into depth more about this right now for the, really the remainder of the sermon, we're also now moving on to the second point, point B, okay? Away from the parade of witnesses, and the reason why is because this is kind of a turning in the passage from just a declaring of these witnesses to a scathing rebuke. It's a scathing rebuke. The parade of witnesses have spoken. Now for the indictment. The witnesses have taken their stand. Now for the indictment. Now for the judgment. And here's point B. You have not listened. You have not listened. Witnesses, 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 you have not listened. We even saw that a little bit in the comment regarding John the Baptist. This is really point one under B. You didn't follow through with John the Baptist. He says, you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. You notice that phrase? You rejoiced for a while in his light. Well, why didn't you keep rejoicing? He came, John the Baptist came as a witness to bear witness about the light. Okay, and so John the Baptist had, in a sense, a little bit of a glow about him, but he came to shine on the big light, the real light, okay, to point you to the real light of the world, and you just missed it. You just didn't follow through. You didn't really listen to John's sermon. You came and you got baptized, you, you repented of something, but then you didn't believe in Jesus. And he, John's been telling you, behold, the Lamb of God, go, follow him. He's the one, he's the one, and you just missed it. Now, isn't this a warning for us too, that we could maybe go a little bit on our way to Jesus, but not go all the way? That we could be learning, maybe we went to church, we heard the preacher get all animated and excited, and we thought that was cool, but then we just totally missed it. We didn't follow through. We didn't repent of the thing that we're supposed to repent of. We didn't say, wow, these people love Jesus. I don't think I have a love like that. And, and at that moment, what should you do? You should pray, Lord, have mercy on me. Lord, cause me to see your glory. Help me to believe Jesus. And then you should labor with every ounce of your being to get into the word and to get into the church and to get Christians in your life and to pray and to seek him. This is what the witnesses are supposed to do, even today, not just in this time. They're supposed to bring you to Christ. Have you come to Christ? Do you worship Christ today? Is Christ your all-encompassing treasure today? If he's not, you haven't gone far enough. Don't be like these poor Jewish leaders who were willing to rejoice for a little while in his light. They're willing to come a little bit to Jesus. No, come all the way to Jesus today and every day well the second one is even more damning it's what we read in verse 37 to 38 not only did they not listen to john the baptist they haven't been listening to the scriptures at all jesus says to them his voice you have never heard his form you have never seen and you do not have his word abiding in you for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. In all of your religious activity, Jesus is saying, you have not heard, seen, or experienced the Father. That's point two. You didn't, first point, you didn't follow through with John the Baptist. Second, you have not heard or seen or experienced the Father. You've never heard his voice. You're still deaf, he says. You've never seen him. You're still blind. And his word is not living in you. You're dead. What an awful indictment. And may that not be true of any of us here today. Well, here's the third indictment. You do not really believe or understand the scriptures. So he said, you do not have his word abiding in you, but he goes on 
you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life and it is they that bear witness about me. Yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. So Jesus comes on, he goes on with this theme and he's going to narrow it now to Moses as well. He says, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Now, one time, this is a totally off topic right now for a moment. One time, Charles Spurgeon, I can't remember who said what to him, but basically, they said they keep praying uh, for the Holy Ghost, for the wind of the Holy Ghost to stir this congregation. And he said, yes, we do need the wind of the Holy Ghost to stir this congregation, but sometimes we just need the wind as well. We just need some fresh air. I'm wondering if some brother could open a door, get a little bit of um, air in here today, like I'm serious. It is stuffy. I don't, maybe it's the suit jacket. But I don't want you all falling asleep on me when I'm trying to witness to the Lord Jesus. We want to hear, and we don't want something like stale air to keep you from hearing, okay? Well, let's continue. You do not believe in Moses' writings, how you believe my words. That's the indictment again. Under that big banner, you have not listened. You have not received. You have not followed the trail and come to the end. You've not understood the story. You've missed the point. You've missed the center. And we might say, well, how so? How did we miss the point? How did these Jewish leaders miss the point? Well, just consider these words from Moses, and I think you will see what I mean. Deuteronomy 18, 15 to 19. Here's what Moses said. These are the words of Moses. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. I will hold them to account. Now, is that not exactly what we're reading here in John 5? Notice the parallels. I will raise them up from among you. He will, I will put my words in his mouth. The, the son speaks the words of the father. He shall speak what I command him. Whoever doesn't listen to him doesn't honor the father. This is the great prophet. Jesus is the great prophet that Moses said. The greater Moses. One like Moses. A mediator between God and man. Moses, he stood between the gap of God's people. Right? And God, he interceded. And yet he's a foreshadowing. He's just a type of the greater Moses, the true prophet, the one to whom we must listen. The whole Bible is pointing towards Jesus and this moment in redemption history. Now this brings us to point C, the big point here. Christ is the center of the scriptures. Christ is the center of the scriptures. I want to spend a little bit of time on this. You see, the Old Testament is remarkably incomplete it's remarkably incomplete i don't really actually know how jews do it how they without christ that is those who reject christ without the new testament this book ends on an absolute cliffhanger doesn't it all these promises made and yet not fulfilled yet so many promises but without christ in view they're unfulfilled the old testament is like the building of an exquisitely complicated lock to which only Christ is the key. And until you have the key, it's just this locked thing. It's just 39 wonderful books of God's word. But cliffhanger, incomplete. Christ is the key. Exodus uh, 34, 6 to 7. Here's what we read in the Old this is. This, let me tell you, this is the, this is the mystery of the Old Testament. The, the, this is part of the cliffhanger. Exodus 34, the Lord says to Moses, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness, keeping steadfast love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, but who will by no means clear the guilty. What? How? How can you justify and still be just? How can God not clear the guilty 
and yet have mercy on his people. The lock gets even more pins. We read in Psalm 32, Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity. But how? That would be blessed, Lord, but how? Especially when we read a verse like in Habakkuk 1.13, You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, and yet you're going you're gonna to dwell with us as we read in Isaiah For thus says the one, we read this this morning, this was in our call to worship. For thus says the one who is high and lifted up, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit to revive the spirit of the lowly. Do you hear that? He's high and yet he dwells with the lowly. He's high and holy, yet he dwells with the lowly. How can you dwell with me, we should be asking. As you, every Jew who just has the Old Testament should be asking, how am I saved at all? How would God ever dwell with me at all? How can he forgive me? What, how is this mercy going to come? The answer is Christ. The answer is Christ. Christ is the key. If you read the New Testament, you'll see that very thing. The New Testament is constantly referring to the Old Showing how Christ fulfills what has come before, what has been written. There's an estimated 1,600 quotes and references in the New Testament of the Old. It, and this is why, this is, well, I'll get to this in a moment, but this is why abandoning the Old Testament is a bad idea. Because you can't understand the New hardly at all without the context of the Old. But Jesus himself He says this in Luke 24 after his resurrection, referring to the old. This is while he's walking incognito on the road to Emmaus with some of his disciples. He says, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures... The things concerning himself. Now that's a Bible study I wish I could go to. Don't you think? Don't you want to go? Wouldn't you love to hear Old Testament typology and foreshadowing or or biblical theology with Jesus as your teacher? Later in that same chapter, he says to the larger group of disciples, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Psalms really referring to the whole writing. So basically, the entire Old Testament, the whole book. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Now that's a good Bible study. And he said to them, Thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance for the forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. He's saying, you should have known that from the Old Testament, guys. Isaiah told you about that. Moses told you about that. David told you about that. The whole book's about that. You missed it. This is what we're reading here in our passage today in John 5. He says, you do not have his word in you because you don't believe in him whom he sent, the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures, but it's they that bear witness about me. And yet you refuse to come to me. Moses wrote about me. They're held to account for not seeing what they should have seen in the Old Testament. The book, this book is all about me, Jesus said. If you really believed Moses, you would believe me. Now this covers the whole Bible. And this is what we're saying today. Christ is the center of the whole Bible. He's the center of everything. He's the center of God's word. Everything points to him. Now understanding this is critical for understanding the Bible. As I was already hinted at, some have wanted to unhitch Christianity from the Old Testament. You've probably heard that. But that's crazy. Okay, that's like unhitching your house from its foundation. Let's just move this into the sky. That sounds like a good place for my house. Or unhitching your favorite part of a movie from the rest of the film. Let's just watch, let's just watch the climax of that movie over and over and over again with no context. Crazy people do that. That's lame. Or let's, let's unhitch the diamond from my wedding ring. 
out of its gold setting. That's what it is to take the New Testament with no Old Testament. It was all meant to build this wonderful picture, and then Christ is the, at the center of it, and he shines. Well, just because he shines doesn't mean that you get rid of everything that came before, right? It's the context of the Old Testament that we understand who Christ is and what exactly it is that he's done. The 66 books of the Bible are one big story. They're the biggest story of all. This is really talking about biblical theology, understanding the big story from creation to the fall to the big story of redemption all the way to the new creation. This is a miraculous book. It is one story, 66 books, different authors, different times, different places in which they wrote it. And yet it's one unified story. There are types and there are antitypes. There is foreshadowing. There is development. There is progressive revelation where we get to see more and more until the final moment. And it all leads to one place. And this is what we're saying today. It leads to the center, Christ himself. He's the key. This is what he himself is saying here. The scriptures are all about me. Moses wrote of me. The law, the prophets, the Psalms are all about me. Just like we said last week, he's either God or he's either Lord or a lunatic or a liar because no one can say that God's word's all about them unless they're God himself. And he is God himself. He is the Lord. So do not miss the glory of your Bible. Do not miss the glory of Christ in this glorious book. Right from the beginning, we have Christ. Let me just take you through a few things. Jesus is the word in the beginning who created the world. You should see Jesus in Genesis 1. After the fall in Genesis 3, he is the promised offspring who will crush the serpent's head. That's the first announcement of the gospel. You shouldn't miss Jesus in chapter 3. Let me read it, 315. He shall bruise your head, Satan, and you shall bruise his heel. Even there we see not only will Jesus defeat Satan, but he will incur a wound, won't he? He will have a bruised heel. What does that refer to? The cross in Genesis 3. And from here, everything in the great story of redemption begins to point to this great Savior, His blood speaks a better word than the blood of Abel, we read in Hebrews 12. That's from Genesis 4. He will be the truly innocent one, killed out of envy, but his blood will speak a better word than the blood of Abel because it will call out to God for our forgiveness and not for our condemnation. He's the fulfillment of Melchizedek, that mysterious king-priest that you read about in Genesis 14, who brings God's people, what? Bread and wine. And, Abra- and, and, uh, and we have Abraham offering to him a tithe, a tenth of all of his things. You think, what is going on here? Well, read the book of Hebrews. You'll find out a bit more about it. He's the fulfillment of this king-priest type. He's the true and better Isaac. You know, we talked about this a few weeks ago. He carried, he carried the wood for his own sacrifice up that hill as an obedient son, just like Isaac. But unlike Isaac, Jesus was actually killed on that mountain. The father gave his son, his only son, whom he loves for us because he loves us. That's the fuller meaning of that story. Yes, there's the, it's a test of Abraham's faith, and we should read it in context, but don't miss that in, unmistakable picture of Christ in that well we move on just i'm just showing you the glory of your bible here jesus is the lion of judah okay you think what's so special about judah well we read about this judah character jesus is born of his tribe and he's the true leader judah is supposed to be this leader and if we remember the story he's the one who sacrifices himself for his brothers offers to give himself up he's the one who's promised to hold the scepter and will someday rule the nations Well, Jesus comes from his tribe on purpose. He's the Lion of Judah. Jesus is the true and better Joseph. He's like like Joseph. He's betrayed by his own people unto death. But against all odds, he rises again to reign in power at the right hand of the king, only to forgive and protect and to save his very betrayers. That's Genesis. Genesis. He's the greater prophet than Moses. We already saw Moses say that in in, in Deuteronomy 18. But you think Moses' face, 
It would shine in the presence of God, wouldn't it? Well, Jesus, we read in Hebrews 1.3, is the true radiance of the glory of God. Moses mediated between the people of God, but Jesus is the mediator of a new covenant. John will say in chapter 1, we read this months ago, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. He is the, Jesus is the great deliverer of a greater exodus. Moses led the people out of slavery into the promised land, the freedom of that. Well, what has Jesus done for us? He has led us out of death, out of slavery to the devil, to the world, to our own sins, into the freedom of knowing God and being in his presence and one day crossing that great river into the new heavens and the new earth. He's the true Passover lamb. 1 Corinthians 5, 7, for Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Under his blood, the angel of death passes us by and we are saved. Do you have the blood of Christ over your doorpost? Do you see that in that story? You need to be covered by the blood of Christ. He needs to have died for you and you need to trust in that blood. If you are under that blood, you will be saved. We read in Romans 5, 9, Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. He's our manna in the desert. As we will read in the next chapter, chapter 6 of John, Truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus is the bread of life. He's the rock that Moses struck in the desert that gives out living water, life-giving water in the desert. He's the one lifted up like the serpent in the wilderness. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life, John 3, 14 to 15. He's the true Lamb of God, the fulfillment of every sacrifice. He's the true priest, the fulfillment of every priest. He's the true temple. He's the mercy seat. He's the greater Joshua. He's the greater Boaz. He's the greater David. He's the key to the Psalms. He's the true son of David, the king forever, that your son will reign forever and ever. That's David. That's not Solomon. He's the greater Solomon. In Isaiah alone, we see that he is Emmanuel, God with us. He's the great light in the darkness. He's the prince of peace. He's the servant of the Lord, pierced for our transgressions. He's the branch of Jesse. He's the banner for the nations calling the coastlands to come to him. This is who Jesus is. The whole Old Testament tells his story. He's the center of the book. He's the center of the universe. He's Daniel's prophesied son of man ascending into the heavens to sit at the Father's right hand to reign as king forever. And we read in Daniel 7, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. It's all about him. It's all about him. Do not miss Jesus. Listen to the witnesses. Listen to the witnesses. As Graham Goldsworthy, theologian, says, the meaning of all the scriptures is unlocked by the death and resurrection of Jesus. When you see what, who Jesus is and what he's come to do, you have the key to understanding God's revelation. He is the capstone of it. He's the fulfillment of it. The, God, long ago, God spoke to us by his prophets, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his son. And his son is the fulfillment of all that those prophets said. We read in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 1.20, For all the promises of God find their yes in him. That is why it is through him that we utter our amen to God for his glory. Well, let's bring this to a close. Here's what we're saying. There is no salvation in mere scripture reading or mere law keeping. For example, no one keeps the law and the devil knows the Bible better than we do and yet it doesn't do him any lick of good. The scriptures tell us the good news and the law itself points us to our one and only hope, Jesus. He says to them, 
You've put your hope in Moses. You have set your hope on Moses. And this brings, the problem's not with Moses. And the problem's not with the law. The problem is that they are resting on their own obedience to the law, which is a failed obedience and a failed understanding. Don't rest on the law. Don't rest on your efforts. Don't rest on anything except for Christ. You know, that's, that phrase, set your hope on, is a great synonym for what it means to believe. When we say time and time again, believe in Jesus, what we're saying is set your hope on him. When you're thinking, am I right with God? Am I going to be okay with God? Whatever at that moment gives you hope is the thing that you are trusting in. If you're trusting in how well you did this week, you're missing it. If you're trusting in something that happened years ago in your life, you're missing it. You need to be in a, you need to have a living and abiding trust in the Lord Jesus. That's believing. That's faith. Setting your hope in him. Christ is the center. God, the Son incarnate, the Lord Jesus, he is the absolute center of everything. So we shouldn't be surprised that all of our sermons and teaching just keeps connecting to him. We, everything orbits around him as the sun. He is the center. We're all connected to him. It would be a problem if our sermons and our teaching didn't, if we started to drift away from the gospel. Or it would be a problem if in your own life you started trusting in something else or drifting away from the Lord. He is the center. As I've said before, we will never graduate from this gospel. We will never move on to deeper truths. It's further up and further in. It's Christ, Christ, and more Christ. He's the center. And in the end, this will be our song forever. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Amen. Father in heaven, we do, we do utter our amen and we say thank you for your word. Help us to be students of it to study the scriptures, not that we would miss Christ, but that we would see more of his glory. For faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Thank you for your word. We have no idea how much of a treasure it is that we have this book. Thank you that not only do we have the book, but we have Christ, whom this book is all about. Lord, would you stir our hearts, cause us all to trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen.